The Roswell Incident of 1947 is easily one of, if not the, most popularized UFO crashes of all time. It's been the subject of movies, documentaries, and is of course tied to a mountain of conspiracies about an ongoing government orchestrated cover-up of the fact that we are not alone in the universe. For this episode, I want to discuss an alternative to the usual Roswell story. One that doesn't involve aliens or UFOs, but one that might be even darker and explain the government's need for secrecy. I'll start by giving a brief overview of the Roswell story slash timeline to get things going. By 1947, the idea of aliens and UFOs wasn't new. It was in fact gaining popularity as human awareness of space was on the rise, and of course exploration was just around the corner, thanks to advances in rocketry coming out of World War II. Not to mention cameras were beginning to be widely available for the first time, and in general, aviation was rapidly becoming the mega-industry that it is today. So in July of 1947, when rancher Mac Brazel stumbled upon some unusual debris in a pasture, Mac, who had previously found downed weather balloons, felt it was unusual enough to contact the sheriff, who in turn contacted the Roswell Army Airfield. The Army went back to the location and collected the debris. A story was published in the newspaper, describing what they called a flying disc. This, of course, raised more than a few eyebrows, and the story was followed the very next day with a new story, titled, Army Debunks Roswell Flying Disc as World Simmers with Excitement, though Mac Brazel maintained that it was not a balloon. Mac Brazel's family and those close to him recall him being in a very excited state over the whole incident, and take it as a given that the patriotic Mac was sworn to secrecy, and he took his oath very seriously, and thus took the most explicit details of what he really knew about the crash to his grave with him in 1964. There are, of course, a lot more threads you can pull, even within that timeline of just a few days if you want, and we will revisit at least one of them in a moment. But for now, let's skip forward to 1994, when the government revealed, slash claimed, that the incident in 1947 was the wreckage of a balloon from Project Mogul, a secret program to use sensitive high-altitude microphones to detect Soviet nuclear tests that ran from 1947 to 1949. Which seems to make sense out of the whole story. It was a balloon, right? But an unusual secret balloon wrapped up in the early stages of the Cold War. And as such, Brazel probably was debriefed and made to sign some sort of NDA. But there's one particular thread that this conclusion leaves unresolved. The bodies. Glenn Dennis was a mortician at Ballard Funeral Home in Roswell in 1947. He claimed to have received a series of strange phone calls from the Roswell Army Airfield about how to best handle and preserve small bodies that were exposed to the elements. These phone calls were followed by a panic-stricken visit from a friend of his who was a nurse at the base. She described three bodies recovered from a wreck and even sketched them out on a notepad for him. They agreed to speak again sometime about this, but that was the last Glenn would ever hear from her. Were these incidents related? Well, the pop culture answer seems to be yes, because that's really the only answer we've ever had to go on. Now, there is a military answer that the three bodies were small rubber test dummies, the kind pushed out of airplanes with parachutes to fool the Germans in World War II. But why would obvious rubber test dummies make it to a medical exam room and frighten a nurse? And if there was no medical exam, then why would the military even feel compelled to address the issue? It gets worse for the rubber dummy explanation, when you add the testimony of Melvin Brown, who was called from the base to serve guard duty over the wreckage as it was transported off the ranch. He was ordered to climb into the back of a truck and go back to base, but not to look under the tarps. When no one was looking, he snuck a peek, and he saw the strange dead bodies for himself. I'll post some links to a more complete Roswell timeline, and some of these other threads you can pull in your own, over at lorenlegends.net. But let's get to the whole point of this episode, the alternative Roswell, that doesn't require aliens or crash dummies, but is perhaps even more dark and sinister. The following account is paraphrased from ufo-scientificresearch.blogspot.com, a blog ran by longtime UFO researcher Keith Basterfield. The post in specific is called Jacobson, Redfern, and the Adelaide Informant, 
and it will be linked to in the show notes over at lorenlegends.net, which you can get to by clicking the link in the episode description. Here we go. A man named Martin, in Adelaide, Australia, claimed that his father was British intelligence, and that when Martin was 12, he told him a story that he could never repeat. In the late 1940s, the Americans were working on getting into space. One of the chief concerns was returning humans from space, surviving re-entry and recovering the craft on the ground, as water was not yet considered a landing option. The Americans experimented by dropping various designs of landing craft from high-altitude aircraft and large high-altitude balloons. They used parachutes and a series of retro rockets to slow their descent, and these were tested at night for obvious reasons. Animals were sometimes placed on board as test subjects, but for this particular experiment in 1947, they needed three live people. The U.S. government used three individuals who suffered from a condition called hydrocephalus, without their consent. Hydrocephalus is water on the brain, a condition that results in an enlarged head, deficits in muscle tone and strength, and overall poor growth alongside a host of other complications. There's pictures of this over at loreandlegends.net. The craft carrying these three individuals went off course and crash-landed over a ranch outside of Roswell, New Mexico, where it was witnessed by a local rancher. The military moved swiftly to cover up the incident, intentionally releasing the flying disc story as a sensational cover story, only to discredit it a day later and make it seem as if nothing had happened at all. So was the U.S. government doing classified, high-altitude experiments using disabled human subjects without their consent? And did one of these experiments crash in an area outside of their control and give rise to the Aliens of Roswell story? In my opinion, this is actually pretty believable. In the 1930s and 40s, all sorts of high-level experiments were carried out by the dark forces of government, and also within the confines of academia. In the 1930s, syphilis was intentionally given to nearly 400 poor black male subjects without them knowing in Tuskegee, Alabama, as part of a study of the effects of the disease. They were offered treatment, despite not knowing they were even infected with syphilis. But no real treatment was ever given. These appointments were merely opportunities to monitor the infection. This continued into the 1970s, and the wives and partners of these men were also infected, and many children were born with birth defects as a result. The government never did anything about this until it got caught in 1972. And even then, all it did was stop intentionally infecting people. Orphans were also common subjects of cruel experiments, and babies were often reported as volunteers in other experiments. At the Nuremberg trials at the end of World War II, Nazi scientists even cited an American study of malaria that used prisoners as unknowing subjects as a defense for some of their own experiments on unwitting Jews. It was absolutely not beneath the United States government to take advantage of the neediest of its own citizenry, especially if it was a forgotten group of minorities or children. There are many, many examples of this if you just search. So, could the three small bodies have been toddlers who suffered from hydrocephalus? Head over to loreandlegends.net and look at some of the pictures. It looks an awful lot like a classic alien, doesn't it? An enlarged head, skinny limbs, and even the color if you think about it. Gray would make sense if you consider that these individuals would have died in a crash, been cold, stiff, burned, and dirty. And this was, of course, before the internet as well. Hydrocephalus might be something that most of us have never even heard of or seen. Today. Now, imagine you're outside of a small BFE New Mexico town in 1947, and you get surprised by something crashing in a field in the middle of the night and find three bodies with some stage of this strange condition. Of course the government would cover it up. Let's also not forget this was just a couple hours drive from where the first American atomic bomb was tested and where Nazi scientists like Werner von Braun were flying modified Nazi V-2 rockets, even taking the first picture from space in 1946. If a wild, high-altitude experiment was going to happen, this was absolutely the place for it. Anecdotally, I'd also add President Eisenhower's push for a civilian space agency in the late 1950s, removing the domain of space from the DoD. So what do you think? 
Was the events of Roswell in 1947 just a balloon test? Or was it aliens? Or was it some weird mashup of the two, involving balloons, space travel, and vulnerable humans who might seem like aliens and as such were denied rights? Share this episode with a friend, figure out what you think, and leave me a comment over at loreandlegends.net. Well, that's all for this episode. See you next time.